I, I have no idea whether we're doing better. Uh, there are a fair number of cookie cutter treatments out there that are being offered where all, all the clinician thinks they need to know is this veteran has a diagnosis of PTSD and these are the treatments for it and we're going to give this person the treatments and there we've done something. We're certainly doing a lot of things, but whether we're actually preserving veterans' capacity to have a flourishing life after war, a good life for a human being after war, I don't know. I just don't know. I've spoken to service members, including officers, who've told me that the one-size-fits-all response to any criticism of what's going on is, well, you volunteered for this. You volunteered for this. Well, I do not regard military service as a signing up for being a slave of the state. People must maintain moral agency especially officers must maintain moral agency. It seems to me that we really need several things. One is we need massive education for the families and for the veterans and for employers, civilian employers. Boy, you look at these guardsmen and reservists who are coming back to a civilian setting, they've lost the social support, their families don't have the social support of the, the families on a base, and they come back and sometimes they've lost everything. They've lost their job, sometimes their house, they've, sometimes they've lost their families because that after a third deployment or something, the, 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 the spouse says, I've had enough, and I'm taking the children and going back to my parents. And they've lost everything. But let's talk about what we need some process of moving people back to civilian life. I had an experience at an, at an army conference uh, where it was soliciting graybeards like myself for uh, some ideas. And I said, I think it's critical that we have a period, pro probably no less than a month, at the end of each term of enlistment, when somebody's going to leave the service, where you bring the family and the service member to a place where they get together with other families and the service members who are leaving get together and they get a chance to have a lot of education, a time to discuss it, question it. The typical way of mustering somebody out of the service is that they gather everybody on a big base into the largest auditorium on the base, and there's a succession of briefers. This is the outbrief, a succession of briefers. Somebody gets up there and with PowerPoint and handouts set, says something about VA benefits, another about military benefits, another about and so on. But this isn't the way anybody takes in information of a significant source. It's just checking the box. Well, anyway, I got up at this conference and I suggested that there be a serious attempt to at least examine in the research sense what are better and worse ways to separate somebody from military service in terms of the long-term outcome. And it was like that Kurosawa film trick of cutting off the soundtrack and the, I felt like I was talking into an empty oil barrel. 
silence. And then I finished saying my piece, and then the film picked up again as though I had never said a thing. Now, that wasn't me, because there were two other people at this conference who proposed the same thing. And I witnessed the same phenomenon each time. And I think what it is, is that the instant that a military uh, unit perceives that someone is no, not going to return to duty. They want that person out of there as quickly as they can. Get them off my structure, get them off my uh, list of things to think about, get them off my table of organization, off my budget. Get this person out of here as quickly as possible so that he can be replaced by somebody who's going to function. And I came to the conclusion that I was witnessing a cultural thing in this curtain of silence. This is, nothing is happening while this is being proposed. And it will be, it will cost the armed services something to do a decent job of separating the service members and their families and their families from the context of being living on a base, the context of being part of the military community. I present myself as a missionary from the veterans I've served. They don't want other young kids wrecked the way they were wrecked, so listen up and here's how you protect them. And how you protect them is in the qualities of the military institutions. Do you keep people together and promote the creation of positive qualities of community in the face-to-face -face unit? And critical to that is the policies that keep the units stable. Train them together, send them into danger together, and bring them home together. Not rocket science. The second is expert, ethical, and properly supported leadership. And we've already talked a good bit about that. And the third is prolonged, cumulative, and highly realistic training for what people actually have to do and face. So my mantra is cohesion, leadership, and training. Cohesion, leadership, and training. And that those are very sensitive to policy, they're very sensitive to practices of the military services, and to the military culture. But all of those things, policy, practice, and culture, are within the control of the uniformed and civilian leadership of our military institutions. We can do a better job of protecting these good young kids that go into harm's way for our sake. And we, in, a, in essence, we know how to do it, but boy, it's a bear to get the middle, military institutions to really change so that they will do it.